In a nutshell, symphonies developed from being anything pretty much in the 17th century, an introduction to, a, to a, an operatic scene, a, a little bit of music between scenes of an opera, opening of a, an anthem, opening of an oratorio, into by the middle of the 18th century they were becoming a self-contained working form with its own life, with, with uh, melodic development between movements. Certainly by the 1770s, 1780s, the symphony in its own right was becoming um, a popular form. People wanted to hear symphonies. They were the, they were the things that, that were interesting people in concerts. In the, in the early days, court orchestras were not listened to very carefully. They were there to provide background music as accompaniment to car playing or cafe kuchen, you know, uh, uh, that, that, that sort of thing. We owe a lot to the early uh, symphonists for helping make the orchestra the focus. It's a wonderful story, the, the story of, of David and Jonathan and Saul, um, which, is, which is played out during the three and three quarter hours that the, the oratorio takes to perform. So I think Handel very much felt he needed something of equal stature to start this oratorio. It's quite a piece of mu uh, music, the symphony. It's in four big movements. Rather than with a slow section, as most uh, overtures would have started, it starts with an incredibly ear-grabbing bit of fast, um, overexcited music. The function was to, to shut people up, to say, it's starting now, so listen to what's going on. There's a beautiful larghetto which follows it where two solo instruments spin, spin their story around each other and that's again a very operatic thing. You can imagine two characters being, being, um, being the protagonists in this, this movement. And then an incredibly virtuosic third movement which survives in two versions, one for, with uh, an a virtuoso keyboard part which Handel himself played and later he, he uh, rescored it for, a, for oboe which is also an incredible challenge because there's nowhere to breathe at all in bars and bars worth of, of semiquavers. So it's quite, it's quite a spectacular piece of music. And then after he's overexcited everybody in the audience, he then calms everybody down with a beautiful, gentle, lyrical minuet. So then you can start the drama proper um, for the next three and a quarter hours.
the symphonies of, of Richter and, and Stamets, there are many different uh, effects, and you're meant to be startled at one moment, sort of lulled at another moment, all within the space of, uh, of one movement. <laughs> What happened in Mannheim in the 1740s and 1750s was, was very, very new and um, extremely avant-garde. It's rather like um, what was happening in Darmstadt in the 1950s or Paris in the 1960s with Stockhausen and Boulez. Um, it, they, it, the court gathered together the foremost avant-garde composers of the day who were exploring these new ideas of extremes of emotion and also gathered together a, an incredibly crack orchestra. The orchestra was very, very, very famous. What was exciting about these new bands, the, the, the band in Mannheim, for example, or the band assembled uh, by Haydn uh, in Esterhase, was their uh, unanimity of purpose. You know, imagine uh, a a violin section playing some of those kind of figures, those very, very rapid figures with perfect precision, which if you read the descriptions of uh, Italian orchestras, for example, at the, at the very beginning of the 18th century, where it was bowing in all different directions and it was bedlam, um, something like uh, a, you know, a, a well-turned-out court orchestra creating a crescendo that went from absolute inaud inaudibility to you know, something where you had to protect your ears, or a cello randi, or um, uh, you know, brilliant, brilliant trills, or these rising uh, um, uh, arpeggio figures, the Mannheim rocket. It must have been a real shock, actually. It must have been sort of had the same power as uh, I don't know a, a rock group or, so, <laughs> or something, sort of blasting you with their first chord. The music itself, if you analyse it and look at it on the page, actually doesn't look like much at all. It's very quite simple. The harmony is generally very, very simple. But the sort of physical demands, particularly on the violins, are, are quite substantial. They have a lot of just lots of physical energy scrubbing with the bow for long periods of time, which again is a, is a very sort of new idea. It's not often the harmonic content. Later with, with Mozart and Haydn, sometimes that's, that's when you get the more subtle musical process going on, where, where those kinds of things are developed as well. But, but Mozart and Haydn also took a lot from this experimentation which was going on with, with the, the Mannheim Orchestra. The, the slow movement of the Mozart symphony is very, very simple, but there's something very special about the texture. It's a very simple texture with the, the upper strings just gently throbbing in triplets above it. It's a bit like an early 60s rock ballad, actually. It's a, but then underneath that, in a sort of very operatic way, you have the sort of the hairy villain. But I find there's something really wonderful about the idea of this amazing eight-year-old struggling to, to really to, to make this first symphony without his father really watching over his shoulder. From the manuscript, you can see him, the young Mozart, really, really making 
little alterations to get it just right, just how he wanted it. Everything that Mozart was later to become, all these characters, this operatic nature, and it's really, I think, the first piece that, that I feel that you can really feel the, the, the young Mozart there on his own without his father looking over his shoulder too much. The orchestra and the public performance of symphonic music was becoming much, much more important towards the end of the 18th century and, and people wanted to go to concerts and wanted to hear the latest music. Concerts like the Concert Spirituel in, in Paris that were, were set up in, in the middle of the 18th century where Mozart went and had his Paris, his Paris symphony performed in 1778. Haydn wasn't officially allowed to, to, to send his music outside Esterhase. He was actually contracted and, and forbidden to, to allow his music out. It did manage to get out, of course, in, in secret copies. The sort of steamy nature of the opening of the Haydn Symphony is absolutely extraordinary. It's incredible. It really, really is incredible. It's incredibly simple, but it's incredibly uh, effective. Haydn's middle symphonies, particularly those he wrote in the 1760s and 1770s at Esterhase, are amazing bits of modern composition. And you must, must remember that both the composers at Mannheim, Steinmetz and Richter, and Haydn at Esterhase were doing amazing new things with, with the orchestra and the symphony, the form, and exploring all sorts of motivic inventions within, within the symphony and relating all the movements together. In the, the four movements of the, the F minor symphony number 49, um, he sets himself a very strange task. He, rather than having a, at least one movement with a different key, which is often the way that symphonies would go, certainly later on, um, just for, for tonal variety, Haydn keeps every movement in F minor. Every movement is in F minor, with one bit of exception which I'll come to. And every movement even starts with you hearing the same two notes, which is, is the, the, the fundamental, the, the F, and the fifth. So it's a, very, it's a very specific sound that he's setting up for the whole symphony, that that, that is, is your basic sound at the opening of every movement. The second movement's that, and, uh, and, and the, 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 the third movement is also that. Uh, uh, so it, it's, but within that, but he's given himself a, a specific um, task, uh, motivic task within the, within the piece, and even the, the, the themes in, in the movements um, are, are related to each other through, through the, the four movements. The only bit of light relief uh, is in the trio of the minuet, which you suddenly get a little bit of thigh-slapping Viennese light relief, but then we, we were straight back again to the F minor for the return of the trio and then the final movement, which is incredibly hyperactive. such a joy to play Haydn. I mean, you actually feel healthier for playing Haydn somehow at the end of a rehearsal even. You know, it has some most miraculous uh, healing qualities. genius like uh, Haydn comes along and he has a patron who is actually proud of, of uh, his patronage of, of uh, Haydn, um, then 
the, the focus becomes more on, on the wonderful group of musicians and the wonderful things that they're uh, doing. So we have to be grateful to, uh, to Papa Haydn for that.